Well, this morning on the fourth Sunday in Lent, I would like to look at the gospel lesson for today um, from St. John 6, verses 1 through 14, where Jesus does a miracle of feeding 5,000 men with five small loaves of bread and two fish. Though it may have been as many as 10 to, 10 to 12,000 people if there were women and children there with the men as well. Uh, what's, um, uh, John MacArthur says it may be even up to 20,000. But whether it was 5,000 or 12,000 or 20,000, he fed them all with five loaves of bread and some fish. And all four Gospels record this miracle. While St. Mark and, or St. Matthew and St. Mark also mention that on another occasion, Jesus fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. So let me look at John here. John chapter 6, and I want to read the first four verses again. This Bible's big. So after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him, because they saw the signs he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So Jesus most likely was trying to get a little break with his disciples when a large crowd of people see him, and they start to gather around him. But the reason they did this was because Jesus had already been doing all these you know, signs and healing people. So rather than say, though, tell them to go away and come back later, we need, we need to take a break and get some rest. Jesus, no, Jesus shows compassion on the people and begins to take time to teach them. Though it doesn't say it here, it does say it in the other Gospels that he was teaching them for a while. But before we go any further, though, verse 4 says, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And I believe this was, you know, just kind of suddenly in this passage, but I believe it's here for a reason. One of the, was there, one of the reasons was that there had been a lot of people then in that area because this Passover season would soon take place. And second, John reminds us why Jesus came a year later. He would go up to Jerusalem to be the final Passover sacrifice for the sins of the world. As John the Baptist says in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Passover was established in Exodus 12, when the people of Israel were slaves under Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Lord told the people um, of Israel to sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on their two doorposts and the lentils of their house, because the Lord was going to pass through the land of Egypt and strike dead the firstborn in the land, both, both man and beast, except those that put the blood on their doorposts. If they put the blood on the doorposts, then the Lord would pass over, where we get the word Passover from, he would pass over them and not strike dead the firstborn. And they were to continue this every year until Jesus' final, final Passover or sacrifice, and we will commemorate that on you know, Good Friday. But it's worth reading Exodus 12 if you're don't know, not familiar with the story. But back to John 6, and as I said, John 6 was a year before, before Jesus would die on the cross as the final sacrifice for our sin. As John would later write in John 13:1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, being, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So this, again, would be a year from now. I've got to get a different podium. So when this large crowd of people gathers around Jesus, he decides you know, to feed them. The other Gospels say they had been there for quite a while, so they were, you know, I'm sure they were quite hungry. So he asked Philip, where, where can we buy enough bread to feed these people? It says in verse 5, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing Jesus seeing a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test, to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? So some think Jesus asked Philip, because Philip you know, is from this area. But Jesus knows there isn't enough bread to be found around here, but he wants to test Philip. Philip had been with Jesus and saw him doing all these, some already done numerous miracles and healings, so he wants to get Philip's reaction. And this shows us that Jesus does test us at times. Testing helps us to think and to grow, even if we don't get it right the first time or many times, but it still helps us to grow when we're tested by the Lord. And Philip didn't do too well with his test, though. He says, 200 denarii of bread wouldn't be enough. A denarii was then a day's, a day's wage. 
Therefore, 200 denarii would have been about eight months of wages. And then you have Andrew, Peter's, Peter's brother, and he says he found a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish. That's not going to be enough either. And then he continues in verse 10. And Jesus said then, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. And Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted, when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. So Jesus then has them all, you know, sit down, and he says, and it says there was much grass, so it's most likely in the spring, springtime. And that's why our church calendar, the prayer book, follows, you know, the seasons, because uh, Easter's right, it's in the springtime. And he miraculously feeds all five to 12,000 people with the five loaves of bread and two fish, and they eat as much as they wanted. The other gospels say that they were, they were satisfied. And I would ask, are you satisfied then with what Jesus gives you? And after, finishing, finish, after they finish eating, there are 12 baskets left over of bread, and Jesus has them gather, gather it all up so that nothing was wasted. And the people get very excited at the end, and they say, it says in 15, or 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And this is referring to Deuteronomy 18.15, where Moses writes, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So Moses is referring, even back then, to Jesus. And the people realize that Jesus is the prophet, this, this main prophet, though they may not have realized that Jesus is the ultimate prophet, or better yet, that Jesus is the Son of God. Sadly, they were looking more at just, you know, getting more food to eat or getting healed and not looking so much to this, the spiritual side of this. So then let me make some applications of what we've read. Jesus tells us to pray daily in the Lord's Prayer, like, give us this day our daily bread. And as we see, Jesus is more than able to supply us with our daily bread or needs, not always our wants, though he often gives us more than we need or deserve. But we shouldn't worry that, we, that he can't or won't give us what we need. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus tells us not to be anxious about our lives. We're not to worry about what we're going to eat or what we're going to drink or about what we're going to wear. And then says, look at the birds and how your heavenly Father feeds them. And our backyard is always full of birds, lots of hummingbirds and quails. And, and we actually got a hummingbird nest with two eggs in it, so it's kind of interesting. But the birds are always scrounging around, eating and getting plenty to eat without working. Well, they have to work around to fly around. But, but God feeds, just like he feeds the birds, he says he'll take care of us. So instead of being anxious or worrying, he says in Matthew 6.33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So Jesus is saying, put God first, and he will take care of you. Though I'll admit, it's, you know, it's not always easy all the time. It's not always easy. Sometimes things can get pretty tight or pretty hard, right, rough in life. And now it's even more difficult for many people you know, to make a living with the inflation rising and the higher gas prices as well. But just like Jesus tested Philip, the Lord may be testing us when times are difficult. Do we trust the Lord? Do we believe his promises? So I believe Jesus is saying, trust in me and I'll supply your needs. But we also saw, we also saw in John 6 how Jesus said, gather up the leftover, leftover bread so that none of it was wasted. So if a person, you know, is, is wasteful or buying things they can't afford or don't need, then they really shouldn't complain, you know, if they don't have enough. But nevertheless, I believe God takes care of his people who put their trust in him. In Philippians 4, 6, St. Paul echoes what Jesus says when he writes, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So Jesus and Paul are saying, don't worry or be anxious, but rather pray and trust in the Lord. So again, it's not always easy. Oops. Another verse also helps where Paul writes in Romans 8.32, Get in there. Or Paul says, He, that is God, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Right? So he's not going to 
He's not going to forsake us. He's going to take care of us. God is. So the point is, if the Father gave Jesus to die for us, he's going to take care of us. Another question somebody brought up when I was reading some books on this subject, or on this chapter, it says, what if, how, the question might be, if, if Jesus can do miracles, why didn't he just make some bread appear miraculously in each person's hand, so to speak, or similar to the, the manna? The manna just you know, came down and they all just gathered up the manna. Instead of multiplying the loaves, you know, like he did. But God often uses means. For example, when people make bread, right, they make it from recipes. They combine ingredients such as yeast and flour and various other things, and they bake, bake them together, you know, to get bread. It just doesn't just happen. And Jesus, in this case, took the five loaves and gave thanks and prayed over, prayed over them and fed 5,000 people or more. So I assume, I guess at some point, he just took the bread and kept pulling it apart and handing it out until it finally was enough. I don't know for sure, but it distributed them to the people. And when he says thanks, when he gave thanks, that's the same with the Greek word Eucharist, Eucharist, where we get the word often for the Lord's Supper. We say the Eucharist, which means to give thanks, because we get thanks to God for you know, giving himself on the cross. And another question was asked, why, doesn't, why Jesus doesn't just make us perfect when he saves us from our sins? It's getting a little off point, but I thought it was an interesting thought. I don't know if there was a, you know, if you're familiar with Daryl Porter, was a baseball player back on the Cardinals. And in 1982, they won the World Series, and he was a catcher, and he, he got the most valuable player. But before that, he had had quite an a interesting life. He had become a, quite a drug addict and drinking and became extremely paranoid. He used to sit up in his attic with a gun, just kind of watching for people to come get him. And he became, when he became a Christian, then he, he you know, straightened out his life. But... You know, we always struggle with sin and so forth, and that's the title of his book was uh, Snap Me Perfect, kind of like, you know, why doesn't God just make us perfect? But normally I, he does not. But then again, he actually does make us perfect when he saves us from our sins, when we believe and trust in Jesus by faith. It's called justification by faith alone. It's a one-time one -time incident. But when we're justified by faith, we're cleansed from all our sins. And in one sense, made perfect as recovered by the blood of Jesus and saved by grace. Yet we still sin. Later in John 13, verse 1, where, or John 13, if you remember the story where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. And he, um, Peter says, well, you're not going to wash my feet. And he says, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you're not part of me. And he says, well, then wash everything. And he says, no, you're already clean. All you need to, is to wash your feet. And I think that's kind of an illustration of us. We're made clean by the blood of Christ, but we still sin. We get dirty feet, I guess you would put it. So we're constantly needing to be cleansed in that sense or forgiven. And God, So God uses means to sanctify us, or sanctify means to set us apart, or to, or to help us grow in holiness. The sanctification process then takes a lifetime. Justification is a one-time thing, but sanctification is all our lifetime. So in that sense, we won't be perfect until we get to glory. But in the meantime, meantime, the Lord uses means to help us grow in grace and in holiness. As Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.18, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But what are the means or how do we grow in this sanctification process? Well, the first way to know about God and Jesus and how to grow then is in the scriptures. To know God and God's will, we need to read and hear the Bible. Later in John 17, 17, Jesus says to the Father, or prays to the Father for his people, that he would sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So we're sanctified by God's word. It's truth. Sometimes I read or hear people say, I believe in Jesus, but not a book, referring to the Bible. But the Bible is the only place where we can learn and know about Jesus. But often the reason people say they don't believe in a book, the Bible, is because they don't like what it says or they don't like certain parts, they don't, they don't agree with them. So they want to make Jesus in their own image or their imagination. But we know we have to take scripture for what it says. So The next way to, to, to grow, the next way to grow is then to, to pray. In scripture we talk to God. Wait, in scripture God talks to us and in prayer we talk to God. For many people, prayer can be difficult, which, again, is why we read, read the Bible, so that we can better understand God's will and how to pray. And we can pray what's on our mind and our hearts, and we should. 
of course we need to pray for the things in our life, but there are also helps, like if, you're not, if you have a hard time with prayer, like the Book of Common Prayer, like morning and evening prayer can help. Sometimes the written prayers can give us other ideas to build on. You know, and we're not just supposed to pray, you know, asking God for things all the time, but part of prayer is to worship Him, to give Him praise and worship. And the prayer book may lead us more into that than asking for things. And, some, and, and the Psalms, Psalms are mostly prayers too. The Psalms can be very helpful for prayer. In the Anglican tradition, we pray lots of Psalms. Many Anglicans pray all 150 Psalms in a month. Though we don't have to pray that many Psalms a month, one or two or three a day, you know, can be helpful. Of course, the Lord's, Lord's Prayer can guide us in our prayers as well. And I remember reading Martin Luther used to say he was so busy he couldn't pray less than three hours a day. He had to pray three hours a day because he was so busy, which sounds kind of ironic in a way. But Martin Luther also, that was his job, if you call it that, his job. You know, most people have to work and do other things, and that was his work, or a pastor's work should be you know, time to pray and study. But Martin Luther, though, did have a good way to do it, though, another way to help you pray. He would pray through the Lord's Prayer, the creeds, and the Ten Commandments. So, you, again, there's different things that can help you give you other thoughts for your prayer life. And one other way, not the only ways, but another way to grow is attending worship at church with, you know, God's people, like we're doing here, where we read and hear the word and pray and praise the Lord together. But we also receive the sacraments of baptism in the Lord's Prayer, and we don't do that by ourselves, you know, not, not in normal circumstances. And because we only get baptized once but receive the Lord's Supper weekly or on a regular basis, depending on what church you attend or you're in, let me finish with a few words on the Lord's Supper as it relates to Jesus and bread. Now, I just want to look, go up a little further and read some of the verses that kind of help explain what Jesus has been teaching here. So in John 26 and 27, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So Jesus is making a point, you know, daily bread's important, but it perishes, you know, but... The bread of life, which is Jesus, as we'll see, the bread of life gives us eternal life, so it's much more important. Of course, we have to eat here, but our eternal life is going to be a lot longer than our time here. And then Jesus says, oh no, not yet, and then 31 and 32, our fathers, they tell, they are talking to Jesus, they say, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. It's kind of what we saw in our Old Testament lesson. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So again, Jesus is making the point. He is the true bread. He is, the, he is what's most important. And of course, he says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So Jesus is the bread, or the bread of eternal life. And just a few more verses, 47 through 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness, and they are dead. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that you, one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give, the bread that I will give, for the life of the world is my flesh. And you could really take that on an interesting turn, but I won't go there. So now there is a sense then that this is referring perhaps to the Lord's Supper, many people would say. Though I don't believe, and it could be, but I don't believe the Lord's Supper gives us eternal life because we receive eternal life when we're you know, justified by faith. But So what he's saying is when he says he gives his flesh, he's talking more of the cross than the, than, than the Holy Communion, I believe. But I do, at the same time, believe the Lord's Supper is another means of grace that helps us to grow in our, our sanctification process. Now, there are different opinions in the various branches of Christ's church, as I say, on what happens at the consecration of the bread during Holy Communion. Even among, among Anglicans, there's many different views. Though Article 28 of our 39 Articles says, 
The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after a heavenly and spiritual manner. And the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. So the articles teach we receive the body, the bread or the body of Jesus in a spiritual manner by faith. And I would agree, and I believe I've heard Pastor Steve say a number of times that we also receive it in a spiritual sense. And then let me close then with a quote from Sinclair Ferguson on, on the Lord's Supper that brings an interesting perspective to what the supper means. I thought it was, I'd never look at it this way. I'm too busy debating and arguing over what it means rather than look at the positive note here. But, but Ferguson bases his thinking here on Revelation 3.20 where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Then Ferguson writes, these words, then, are a beautiful description of what happens at the Lord's Supper. We receive into our hands physical emblems of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We take them, indeed, we take them into ourselves. And by faith, we receive the love the Lord Jesus ex expresses. Although He is invisible to us, He expresses His love for us by giving these tangible gifts to us to remind us of who He is and what He has done. They carry the message. I have loved you so much that I was willing to die for you. I am present with you now as your risen Savior and friend. Take these love gifts from me. And I'll end it with that. And may God bless his holy word. Amen.